All right, uh, good morning. As uh, I got lots of welcome here, especially from Peter and from Abby as well. My name is Kevin Robinson. I graduated from the Mount in 2012. And I can confidently say the last 10 years when I started here in 2008 has been a total whirlwind. Um, it's been a mis mixed experience. Um, of course, I obtained my degree here. I met my future wife here who just showed up. And this is why I love her, because I don't know where she finds ways to surprise me and support me. And uh, yeah, it's been a really interesting ride. Um, so as a lot of you are wondering, a lot of questions I've had so far, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Robinson's Cannabis Inc., a company that started back in 2000, and really back in 2012, we officially incorporated it in the beginning of 2014. Don't be fooled, my role is the Chief Executive Officer, but that's just a glorified way of telling you that a job specialist. I do everything. I keep my hands on the pulse in all sections of the business, from financial to ordering toilet paper, which supplier, all that under signage. Every section of the business has my view on it. So the way I got started in the cannabis business is my oldest brother, Andrew, is, he's the oldest, I'm the youngest. He um, is a plant science major, and essentially he's had an interest in cannabis his entire life. He worked in the legal cannabis framework in the early 2000s. In 2012, 2013, he reached out to me and said, Kevin, I really think cannabis is going to flip over to a commercial model. I think this is really interesting and a big opportunity. We should learn more about it. And he pushed on me, pushed on me, and it was a great influence because I read the rules, we stayed abreast of it, made a business plan, we started to make pretty much predictions of what the future might look like. Mind you, back then, in 2013, 14, we thought by 2015 or 16, we'd be running a business and uh, we'd be, it would happen a lot quicker. Unfortunately, in 2018, we're still getting closer to that, that check mark. So as of right now, we, are, we have 12 acres in Kenfield Industrial Park. Uh, clickers, what do I point? There we go, up there. So this is our building as of uh, a few weeks ago. Um, this time last year, it was 12 acres of open land. Now we have it cleared, and this is our construction uh, site right here. We're hoping to get occupancy in December of... Uh, 2018, so just in a couple months, and it's a really exciting time for our team to see all the planning that we put into place. Uh, we've just hired five more people to get us started this uh, right before Christmas, and it's a really exciting time for our business, and we're really looking forward to jumping off. So I'll give you a bit of background. As uh, Peter may have mentioned, and you might see in some of my bio and stuff, I've always been an entrepreneur. I was an entrepreneur before I even knew what entrepreneurship even meant as a teen and even as an adolescent. I was buying things, selling things, buying on eBay, using the internet, stealing mom's credit card to buy stuff even though she wasn't comfortable. I was doing different things because I wanted to try to find different ways to make money and I was con convinced that I could essentially do anything I wanted, at least I could try anyways. So to set the stage, in 2016, prior to this story, I always did a lot of things in tandem. I owned a business, uh, I worked in a job, and I was completing my studies. So in 2016, uh, at that point, I was well done on my CPA and my MBA. I shut down some of my side businesses, uh, maybe because of lack of focus or maybe bad advice. And I stuck to my guns and my wealth management position in the corporate world. About six months into this position and kind of down this path, I started to realize that you know, I was reaching a lot of my goals. I obtained my CPA and MBA as I had been focused on for so long. I wanted to purchase a host by the time I was 25. We did it. I wanted to drive a car that I was proud of. I did it. I get to travel. I felt like I was getting places. I felt like I was reaching my goals. And now it was like, now what? I got where I wanted to be. Now what? So I, I made the rash decision to think of myself and seeing this, this business, of the cannabis business. At the time, it was called Canna Hort, uh, Horticulture. And essentially, we were kind of didn't know our path, didn't know the future. There was time we didn't have the funding that we required. So there was really no money for me to go work there. So essentially, I was kind of in this place of now what? Everything seemed to be stagnant. And for a while there, I was starting to think to myself, a lot of the advice that I was given from my parents, my teachers, um, friends, anyone, and they all meant well for me. They said, you know what? Get in with a good company. Climb the ladder. Get a beautiful pension. When you're done, you, you know, you'll have this, and you can relax and enjoy your years. And I thought about this, and in theory, it sounded fantastic. But in practice, it was saying to myself is, OK, I don't really like what I'm doing every day. What if I want to do the stuff I want to do when I'm 55 today? What if, when I'm 55, I don't have the health that I have today? Or what if I don't make it to that age? So I started to think to myself, I wanted to make a change in my life. 
And I heard so many people say to me, successful people say to me that, you know what, I wake up every morning, I look in the mirror, and I do exactly what I wanted to do today. I said, wow, that sounds, sounds amazing. And I knew for a fact that if I asked myself the same question, I wake up, I look in the mirror, and I say to myself, you know what, this isn't what I wish I was doing today. There's a lot of other things that I wish I could be doing. So at that point, I made a decision. I notified the firm that I was working at that I would be leaving in three months, unannounced, uh, and really just uh, out of nowhere. At the same time, I had some vacation left over. I took it all, and I started working volunteer in the cannabis business. Every Friday, every time I could take off, I would go to our offices in Truro at the time, and I would work on the business, figure out the path. Where are we going? How are we going to do this? How is this going to work? What is it going to look like? And at that time, I made the shift. And I tell you, when I made that shift to working completely on my own, completely independently, like I said, I've been running things in tandem my whole life. To just be into this at that point, it was a really tough time. The cannabis business didn't have that much money to pay me, so I was forced to do other things. I did some other consulting with other businesses, and I thought my skill set at the time, and I still believe it is, is that I make, and my passion is to make business ideas a reality. I'm pretty confident that I can take most business ideas that I think are worthwhile and make them into commercialization, bring them to market, bring them to consumers, bring them to buyers, bring them to life. And at that time, I was doing a lot of stuff, and I'll be honest with you, I was answering Kijiji ads, I was mowing people's lawns, I was returning bottles, I, was, I bought vending machines. I did all kinds of things because I was pretty much at a point in my life where, okay, I'm on my own here, it's all me, I gotta make this happen, and if I don't make this happen, I've got a host, I've got responsibilities, I, I have things that I just, I have to maintain this. And essentially, it put me in a point of survival mode. And I'll tell you something that, when you're in survival mode, it'll change you forever. And I think in a very positive way. And I don't mean survival mode, it wasn't life or death for me. And I don't mean to you know, put a negative connotation or downplay you know, survival. But at the time, it was, it was just me. And I made, had to make this happen. And my wife was a great supporter. But we were in survival mode for paying our bills, getting ahead, building our self-esteem, all of these pieces. And being in survival mode will make you somewhat spiteful at times. It'll make you truly understand what's important, who's important, and those that your life does not need. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about that journey I had from shifting, making my decision, going out on my own, and being forced to be in somewhat of a survival mode and go down a new path that I never took before with a lot of things in limbo and a lot of uncertainty. So I'll start off by saying, here we go. This is a disclaimer photo. This photo is not my photo. I'm gonna take a page out of Peter Mumbercut's book here. He loves to use lots of pictures in the presentation, and I think it's a great idea because you don't have to look at my face the whole time. And there's uh, some dialogue here, of course. And I don't own this photo. I don't own any of the photos in them. So this is just a legal disclaimer to make sure that I don't get any legal trouble for using photos that are not mine. So we're all clear, we, we agree. So I'm gonna talk about some key points. And remember that I'm not perfect. I don't nail these every single day of my life, but I always keep them in mind, I strive for them, and they're earmarked for me about the decisions I make. And uh, my whole experience has changed the way that I look at my life, my time, my work, and gaining fulfillment, ultimately. So the first one is, do you. Be yourself. The thing I hate the most is pretending that I like something, or pretending that I like somebody. That's a really tough position to be in because it takes a lot of work. And when you try to be other people, it makes it very hard to, oh, I'm two steps ahead, to separate yourself. If you want to sound like everybody else, you want to be like somebody else, how are you ever supposed to separate yourself and be yourself and be genuine? I find the biggest thing, I'm going to go back one here, it's so much easier to be yourself, and it also does a good thing for you because it attracts other people to you. And when you be yourself and be genuine, you become a magnet. People that also feel the same way, genuinely, naturally, they want to come to you and speak to you too. You align yourself with other people that have same interests, same viewpoints, same passions. You declutter people that don't matter or things that don't matter by attracting things that matter directly to you and resonate with you. So on top of that, this clicker is a little test you. Know. Anyways, so on top of that, you know, it's, it's very important to just be yourself. And ultimately, I know a lot of people say, hey, I'm still trying to figure out who I am. And that's okay. I'm still figuring out who I am. 
but just go naturally. Go the way. If you feel like you think a certain way about something, believe it. And I don't mean to be relentless about something and not change your mind and hard-headed. I mean, be open. But if you really feel your way about something, stick with it. If you don't like to talk about certain things or don't believe in such things, then surround yourself with people that also like the same things. It's, it's easier. It's more natural. Less stress will not burn you out. Being yourself will give you stamina. So this book right here is called Getting Things Done. And I'll be totally honest with you, I've never read this book. So, but I did have a great opportunity when I was doing one of my co-ops here at the Mount. Um, one of my supervisors or bosses at the time was a GTD coach, Getting Things Done coach. So him and I talked a lot about stress-free productivity. And I think the real key here is stress-free productivity. Because knowing yourself, knowing your tendencies, Knowing how you work will make it very easy for you to create systems if you're just real with yourself. I know for a fact that I don't wake up naturally at 7 a.m. every morning. It's hard for me to wake up at 7 a.m. So should I book a phone call at 7 a.m. in the morning? No, that would be a bad decision. I know the best times that I work are from 9.30 to 3, and then from 7 to 11. Those are my key times where I have good focus, I have good intention, and I have the ability to do my best work. So the essence of this getting things done, and my point here is, by knowing yourself, create systems for yourself that are realistic and allow you to be stress-free. And what I mean by stress-free is, when we try to remember things, that's baggage, that's stress. I know everyone in here has done it. I've been at the grocery store being like, I'm supposed to get something, I'm supposed to get something. I, I can't remember it, stressing, stressing, even up to the cash register. This is the last second, I gotta remember, no. Then 10 minutes down the road, oh my goodness, I need a batteries. And I just spent the whole time stressing, and you may say, well, whatever, but the whole time I'm tense, I'm worried, I've lost focus, I'm not totally happy. So by creating systems for yourself, find ways that you can rely on yourself to make sure you get things done. And I think this is super important for your relationship with friends and family, your business work, ultimately. Because if you don't do what you say you're gonna do, you lose credibility, you lose trust, you lose loyalty. So ultimately my point is, is make systems for yourself that you can feel like you can rely on. I'll tell you mine, it's a very simple one. I have an iPhone, I have a Macintosh computer, I voice command everything. If I gotta remember to call Sandy next week, call Sandy Tuesday at 7 a.m. Well, I wouldn't do seven because it's too early for me, as you know. Call Sandy at 10 a.m., it goes in there, I forget about it, then Tuesday morning, bing, call Sandy. I just rely on that, I live with that, and that's what I do to control my life. Otherwise, I'm waking up Tuesday morning saying, supposed to call somebody, I don't know who it is, and you're stressing the entire time. And then by the time you realize that I was supposed to call Sandy at 12 and I missed her, she's already mad at me because she doesn't think that I'm accountable or punctual or even respect her time, and I spent that whole time stressing and worrying about what I was missing. No one wins here. So find systems that you can rely on. Time is precious. And I, I'm gonna reinforce too as I talk about all these points today, these are not new points. These are all things that you've heard before, but I'm hoping that maybe some of my story to go with it and some of my, I guess, reasoning may make you reconsider some of these thoughts and just keep them in your mind. So I'll tell you the time when I was in survival mode and it was a tough time for me. You know, when I was working in the corporate world, I, my earnings were here, my happiness was here. And then I left to go, you know, function on my own and my happiness was wide open, my earnings were down, but I lost stamina and I was down on both fronts. And I remember standing one day, and I'll give you a little picture here. Just to, this is my dog, Crew. He's a golden retriever. He's uh, mine and Emily's child. He's my best friend. And I was standing there thinking to myself, I cannot wait till I reach this financial milestone. I can't wait till I get there. I can't wait till I have this status. I can't wait till the business is here. I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. I spent so much time thinking about the future my short-term suffered, not just my happiness, but the quality of work that I did, my focus, everything. So the thing that Crew taught me the most, which I thought was so important at the time, was you can't get time back. So even when you're down and not where you want to be, find happiness in the present. Because not being present, of course, like I said, will make you unhappy, but I promise you, when you get to where you were hoping to get to, or dreading the whole time until you got there, when you get there, you'll be stripped of those responsibilities, but they'll be brand new ones. They might be bigger. They may keep you up at night. They may make you all kinds of different emotions. So ultimately is, 
I know a lot of students, and I know for myself when I was in university, Peter would probably attest to this, is I was so focused on getting out of here and buying a car and buying a house and getting a job, maybe I didn't enjoy my university experience to the fullest because I was so focused on getting to where I was going instead of enjoying where I'm at. So I want you all to enjoy your university experience, your co-op experiences. Don't be too rushed to get to the next level because there's so much to be happy for in the current time. And it's really hard to do good work and maintain a good you know, level of quality in the things that you do if you're consistently looking forward without even appreciating today and working on what's in, right in front of you. Time is the only thing you can get back, period. So going back to time and appreciating today, I'll talk a little bit about success. And success lies in the journey. Again, this is maybe seem cliche to some of you, and you've probably heard it before. But the key to success is realizing that it's a moving target. So as much as we spend so much time thinking about when we get here, when we get our degrees, maybe we go in to get our CPA, maybe we get our first job. I can't wait to get there. It's going to be so nice. Like I said, there'll be more you know, strings attached to that as well. So it's not, you know, you don't climb a set of stairs and you reach success and you just fall on the pillows and it's just this glorious thing. It, it doesn't work that way. Because a lot of the successful people that I meet, for example, you would think that meeting someone who's got a, you know, a very profitable business for a number of years, employs a great number of people, very financially successful, you go to talk to them, they're not sipping Mai Tais with their feet up, thinking, oh, I'm, I've arrived, I'm here, just going to ride it out. <laughs> no, they're, how do I get my business to be bigger? How do I make my employees happier? What do I want to do for my community? I want to go bigger. I want to do different things. You realize that successful people, they don't stop. That's what makes them successful in the first place. So again, enjoy the present. And the key to success is, yes, success is reaching certain milestones. But realize that success is really a lifestyle. And I used to think that success was based on your bank account. I've come to realize that a lot of successful people may not be the wealthiest. For example, there's a lot of professors here that aren't on the cover of Forbes magazine but I consider them to be successful because they're doing meaningful work, work that they, I, I assume, like, and I assume that they're being compensated well enough to have them here to do it. They've got great families, great lives outside of this, and to me, that's, that's successful because they keep going, keep pushing, keep challenging themselves, and I find that very admirable. Next one, create your own measures. And I'll give you an example. So when I was... On my own, like I said, I was answering Kijiji ads, I was working at Peter's Hockey School, I was doing everything I could to get a little money in my pocket and keep going, keep this alive. And I found out that by chasing the money, I was doing the wrong things. I was going from one thing to the next. I had no sustainability. Every week was a brand new start, fresh start. What do I do now? How do I start again? Um, and ultimately, I was just making poor decisions. So what I did was I said, you know what, let's think a little bit about, essentially, I'm on my own, I have my own ship here, what can I do, and what matters to me? So I thought long and hard, and I said to myself, I said, you know what, what truly matters to me, what really makes me happy, if money wasn't on the table, nothing was on the table, is helping people. That's the greatest feeling. So I decided that, yes, I want to help people, and I said, okay, well, I could do one thing, I could go home and make a bunch of sandwiches and go around Halifax and pass them out to homeless people. That would make an impact. And my goal was to, I want to help people and I want to do something bigger than myself. That's what mattered to me. So when I started to realize that, hey, I want to do something bigger than myself, I could pass out sandwiches, but that would be inefficient use of my skills. So I said, I can make a greater impact by focusing on my strengths and using measures to understand that I can help people in greater ways than, you know, as I said, passing out sandwiches, for example. So what I did, and this slide, I have no idea where it came from. It, looks from. it came from a 1980s textbook. But evaluation can also involve weighing possible outcomes. So what I did was, when I was running my business and moving forward, instead of saying, hey, how profitable is this, I decided how much of an impact can this make? How many people can it help? So I use that as my decision matrix. And ultimately, for one example, I work for the Center for Entrepreneurship Education and Development, a great organization that helps entrepreneurs. I was consulting five clients before then. They said, Kevin, we have 25 for you to work with. It was a pay cut, literally cut in half. And instead of saying, nope, not worth it, I said, you know what? Let's just trust the process. This helps 25 people versus the five. Simple, this is easy, follow my metrics. So I went forward with it. Next company I work with is called Lorax Technologies. They're here in Halifax and Dartmouth. They have a leak detection technology that works with any gas or any fluid. 
I'm not sure if you're privy to the United States, but there are a lot of gas explosions. The infrastructure in the United States is very poor, and even in Canada, very poor, because it costs millions just to get to it. And if they put it in, they don't want to make a mistake because they're not again. Still good? Not going to rip the roads up again to change a small part when all the sunk cost is getting to these parts and these components. But I knew, for example, that I was going to work with Lorax not because the pay was good, they didn't promise me anything. But I knew that the impact that their product could make could be huge. It could be worth billions of dollars. It could help millions of people. So I just chose it and went with it. And every day for weeks, I went to their office first thing in the morning. I would stay there from, I'd go at 8 a.m. and I'd stay till 11. I would go every single day. And some days they'd have no work for me. Some days they'd come and say, Kevin, can you help with this? Some days we'd have a deal on the table and I'd prepare some documents for a transaction. So I was just willing to help in any way I could. And at first there was no money available. I worked there for a number of months and I did quite well because I followed my heart and followed my metric on what made the biggest impact. After that, like I said, Robinson's Cannabis has had a, I wouldn't say a bumpy ride, but it's had lots of times of undetermination. And I think it was uh, middle of 2017, my brother called me and said, Kevin, I know we've been working together for a number of years on this. I need you full time now. Things are getting serious, it's do or die. I need you to join our team and I need your help. And again, I already knew I was going to do it because this business has my heart and soul into it and I've seen it from the birth. But again, I said, okay, I've got to use my metric. How many people can cannabis impact? And I don't think I need to tell too many people that cannabis has medical uses, it has recreational uses, spiritual, therapeutic, and it has other uses such as Materials, fabrics, textiles, the list goes on. It takes a tree 40 years to grow to be able to be turned into paper. Cannabis is one year, hemp one year. And then next year, do it again. Why it's so sustainable, the answers are there, but instead, we've got a stigma, and I'll get to that a little bit later. But again, I use that measure, and it pointed me in the right direction to where I am today. So lifelong learning. I, I think this is so important because most people um, that I believe are successful are always learning. And it doesn't mean that, hey, if you're taking accounting now, that for the rest of your days, you're going to be reading about accounting entries and reconciliations. That's not real. Just because you're not learning specific on one skill doesn't mean you can't go and learn about other things. Because the funny thing is, is learning different things, you'd be so impressed by how many things are connected. So when I look back at my CPA and my MBA specifically, and the CPA booth is here today. If you're interested, you should go see them. Um, Ultimately, I was telling Sandy this a few weeks ago that I'll be totally honest with you. When I went to obtain these designations, I did it for the letters. I said, hey, once I have these letters, world's my oyster. I get respect, integrity, everything tied to the designation. Today, if I had to choose between keeping the knowledge I gained from those or keeping my letters, I would throw those letters in the trash. Because the amount I learned in those programs changed the way that I thought forever. It changed the way I looked at business entirely. Because we learn a lot here in the foundational about how to operate a business, the key components of a business. When you start to move on to those pieces, it's how do you fund a business? How do you fund it most efficiently? How do you exit a business? A lot of these intricacies that happen on a bigger stage, and once you can know these, you can prepare for them. You can set your business up with these in mind. You can also see what kind of potential you have for your business that may not be in the realm of what you're exactly thinking. So that was huge for me. Secondly, I find that that it's almost amazing how much information you get, like nuggets of good stuff you get, from the places you least expect it. Sometimes I'm reading a book or a brochure or anything or listening, and someone will say something, and I'll think to myself, I've never thought of it like that. That's a really interesting perspective. And it scares me a little bit because it's like, wow, if I just got that amazing piece of, of insight, imagine all the pieces I'm missing by just ignoring all the other stuff. So a big piece of lifelong learning Ultimately, what I want to share with you is going back to knowing yourself is find ways that work for you. I'll be honest with you. I have a lot of peers that read a lot of books. I, can't, I can read, but I don't read books. I'm just not good at it. I go to bed, I do other stuff, I answer emails, I do other things. I just cannot get through a book. It just, I can't seem to make the time for it or make it a priority, whatever it is. So what I said to myself is I still want to take in all this information. I feel like I'm missing out, but I can't do this at this pace. So I do audiobooks. I watch videos. I listen to podcasts. Just because it's not your typical textbook, for example, doesn't mean there's not tons of information that works for you. I can maybe read one book a week, 
and get really good information out of it, or I could listen to five and get 80% of the information, but I get a lot more information, and, and it works for me, and it's not stressful, and I get a good focus. So I listen to the car, I do different things. So ultimately, is find ways that work for you for your learning. Second part of the lifelong piece is I want to call, I, you know, as you can see, it's, it's skin in the game. It's amazing how much more you will learn when you have something to lose or you're vested in it. What I say to a lot of people who talk to me about, you know, my son or daughter wants to go to business school. Still good. Want to go to business school, for example, and, and I say to them, I say, okay, they're 18 now, they can buy a stock. So what I say is, if you want to give them a real gift, give them 100 bucks, give them 500, give it 1,000 if you're generous. Tell them to invest wisely. And don't just say, hey, go and pick something. Say, what do you believe is the future? Do you think it's self-driving cars? Do you think it's environmental technologies? Do you think it's cannabis? Let them make their own judgments and do research. And they may say, well, I think self-driving cars has a, a really big future. OK, now that you have an interest and you think that's the future, now go look at the players in that space. Read their information. Do the due diligence. Who works for them? What have they done in the past? What's their strategy? Let them do their own due diligence, and then let them invest. Let them see the mistakes that this company makes and learn from it. Let them see the successes they do and how they pretty much extract that information. That, that can be so beneficial. And another piece of this is starting your own business. If anyone here today has you know, a business idea they've been thinking about, but it's not perfect yet, or they just want to try something, ultimately it's amazing what happens when it's all on you. And I'm going to give a different concept that maybe not everyone's uh, used to hearing, but try starting a business without the fixation of income. Because we think that, hey, if we start our own businesses, that means that we make money. True, that's mostly the point. <laughs> but it's amazing what you can do if you put money into a business, invest in something, and you say, I don't need to live off of this. I just want to see what happens and see how big I can make it. So for example, a university course, and I fully think that's a great investment, or any other course for that example. My vending machine business cost 800 bucks. I made the 800 bucks back in a number of months made some other money, and I learned so much out of it. I can't even tell you. And people say, OK, you're a CPA, and you were selling peanuts, and you learned information. There's pockets of knowledge everywhere. And it was amazing, because I learned a lot about consumer behavior, what people did. I learned a lot about different suppliers and different agreements in that space, because every industry has its caveats. So by taking, you know, playing in that space, it's amazing what kind of stuff you can pull out that can be attributable to other industries. So the biggest thing is, like I said, we have no problem spending $800 to $1,000 on a course and getting great information out of it. I think that's a fantastic investment, no question to ask. But don't be afraid to put $800 to $1,000 into a business and say to myself, well, I don't make any money, I failed. No, 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 no. If you can keep that business to be sustainable and get something bigger than what it was when you started, eventually you can probably take money from it. And you'll learn so much along the journey. It's just we get so fixed with starting businesses and pulling money out that we just lose sight of what's right in front of us for lessons and really what's best for the body of the business. So I think if anyone here today is waiting or thinking about an idea, go for it. Again, this is not a surprise. You become your surroundings. And I think this is a very important one because we get influenced by those around us. I know for a fact that if I hang around certain people, they say certain things, I'll say it too. You hang around someone that swears a lot, I'm going to start swearing a lot. They don't swear a lot, I won't swear a lot. I think negatively, they'll think negatively. It's amazing how much things rub off on you by the people that you surround yourself with. And be picky with who you invest your time with is worse than wasting money. It's another picture I just want to drag in there. But ultimately, I gave an analogy yesterday when I was thinking about this. And you got to ask yourself, are the people around you, are they the kind of people that you want to be or you think you are? Are they going the same place as you are? And they don't have to be. You know, not all my friends are you know, CEOs starting businesses. My friends are all walks of life. But they're very positive. They're supportive. Um, we have the same mindset about a lot of things. We don't need to be the same people, but it's about having good influences around you. And the analogy that I thought of the other day was, I play hockey every winter in a beer league. And for example, a few years ago, a guy was on the bench and hadn't played hockey in a few seasons. And he said, you know what, I'm, I'm playing hockey this year. I'm going to play twice a week, and my goal is to have a chiseled stomach by the end of the season. And I looked at him, and I thought, oh, I said, look at everybody in the ice. Does anyone here look like they have a chiseled stomach? Bunch of 40-year-old guys drinking beer, playing hockey. 
Does anybody look like that? No. So if you go into a, a scenario, you go into something expecting an outcome, look around. Do the people look like you want them to look, or you expect yourself to look like? Are they like what you're you know, trying to be? And a lot of this is really important when you, you know, go into the, to get your first job, for example, or another job, or look at different opportunities. I had a lot of business people approach me that faked it. You know, they, oh yeah, you know, I drive a Mercedes Benz, and we got a big business here, it's beautiful, I live in this sort of thing. And I started to peel back the layers a little bit. It's, they're not the kind of people that I want to be around. No offense to anyone in here who drives a Mercedes Benz, but they drove the cheapest Mercedes Benz to say they drove one. They did certain little things to make themselves seem better or more apparent than they were. And I just started to ask myself, is, are these the kind of people that I want to be like? Do they look like how I want to look myself and see myself in the future? So I think it's really important that whoever you spend your time with, again, they don't have to be the exact same career profession. They don't have to be same you know, financial status, whatever it may be. It's just, are they good influences on you? Are they helping you get to where you want to go? Or are they just dragging you? Are they dead weight? And I'll say something because I think it's really important. Just because you have history with someone doesn't mean you have to be friends with them forever. A lot of us feel like we cling to people because we've been through something together or we've been friends forever. That doesn't mean you be friends with them forever. I know it may be selfish, but you only go around the globe or only do this life thing once, so you know, be selfish if you must. Don't stop at I don't know. And Peter kind of highlighted this one a little bit. And this one is um, pretty, uh, I think, something that I didn't even realize. And the funny thing was when, when Peter called me to do this talk, he paid me a nice compliment. He said, uh, Kevin, as he said today, he said, you were never the smartest person in the room. Okay, thank you. Um, the, but he said, you always had good follow through. So OK. And he always figured it out. He always pushed that next level. And the biggest thing for me, and I, I think a lot about my upbringing, my parents, my, I have three older siblings, three brothers. And any time that we wanted to do something, we could do it. Just find a way. And for example, even before I was 16, uh, you can't work, you can't make money, but I wanted money. I've, like I said, as I'm obsessed with bikes and that sort of thing, so I wanted to have different things. So I would go to farmers and say, I can't work, I'm 16, but is there work I can do here that I can do before I'm 16? They said, okay, well, yeah, you can fold boxes, you can do little things. And I, I would do all kinds of stuff. I'd be resourceful. And the biggest thing with, with this is it's amazing how close you can be sometimes, but then you're just stuck at, at I, don't, I don't know. And something I kind of asked myself a few years ago was when I was trying to figure some things out, I would say to myself, you know, and I don't claim that I'm an extremely brilliant person, but there's someone stupider than me that's already figured this out, and they're doing it. So if they can do it, why can't I or why can't we, right? So like I said, I wanted to buy a house by the time I was 25. That was my goal since I was like 18 years old. And when I was 20 years old, I would call around to these brokers, and I'd say, listen, how do I buy a house? What do I need to have money down? You know, how does this work? You know, what kind of credit do I need? I'd ask these questions, and I would just bug people. And a lot of people didn't like me very much because at the end I'd say, oh, by the way, I'm 20, I'm not buying a house for five years, but thanks, right? But the sometimes, I know it's easy for me to say because I'm an extrovert and I feel easy approaching people, but ultimately is don't be afraid to call people and ask questions because a lot of people are willing to answer them. A lot of people are willing to inform you. Like Peter said, all you have to do sometimes is ask. I know it's not the easiest, but I promise you the more that you do it, the easier it gets. Because I'm a firm believer, the more you spend time in discomfort, you'll become comfortable. So ask questions. Don't be afraid to say, OK, well, I want to start that business, but I don't know how. Find someone that does. And that may not be you say, OK, well, that's easy for you to say. You know more people. Well, call your parents. Call your siblings. Call a friend. Call a friend's parents. Call a professor. They may not have the answer, but they may say, hey, I don't know anything about that. But I know this person did it once. Call them. And boom, you're in it. It's so funny how you just reach out, you least sources that you'd expect will have the resources you're looking for. So just don't be afraid to ask. And what's the worst that's going to happen? Sorry, I don't know anything about that. OK, thank you. Click. <laughs> that's the worst that's going to happen. So just be willing to ask. So this one's pretty important to me. Uh, it's called, you know, of course, make time for things that you're passionate about. I think this is really important, maintaining a balance in your life. Uh, in business, um, in your studies, is finding things that you're passionate about that aren't connected to your financial well-being, your success, your status. 
So for example, I've been riding bikes since I was 11 years old. And for the longest time, as a teen, I thought that this is what I was going to do for a living. I didn't really worry about university or anything like that. I was quite confident that I was going to you know, just travel the world and race and do different competitions and do different things. And this is what I love to do, and I thought I was going to do it. Well, when I was about 17 or 18, I realized that A, I wasn't good enough, and B, I was living in the wrong place. So it was kind of like my dreams were crushed. I couldn't do that. So when I came to the mountain, I sold all my stuff, and I just stopped biking. I, I separated myself from it. A year or two after later, I picked it right back up and haven't stopped since. But ultimately, when I talk about when I was at a time when I was maybe at my lowest or my survival mode, where the business with financial well-being was low because the business wasn't excelling, I was feeling low because I wasn't getting to where I wanted to go fast enough. I always had something else that I could do that would lift me up that had nothing to do with any of this. I could say, OK, I'm having the worst business day ever. I could go biking for a number of hours. I could reach a new plateau. I could go somewhere faster. I could jump something further. I could try a different discipline. And it always gave me fulfillment. And I come back from that on a high being like, heck yeah, let's do this business thing. I feel great. But I would never have that source of boost if I didn't have something else I could divert my attention to. It wasn't tied directly to my well-being or my career success, any of those things. So have things you're passionate about and don't forget about them. And the funny thing is, is even though I didn't take the path that I thought I was going to take, I didn't become a professional, well, the great thing is, is I use my skills to work in a world that I have things I love to do and I'm good at. And it's afforded me the ability to fly all over the world to ride my bike. It's funny how sometimes you set intentions for your dreams. They may not be exactly what you think they are, but it's funny how you can still reach them through different avenues. It's actually better now, because now when I travel, I went to Hawaii two years ago. I go to Cal you know, Calgary, Toronto at different times of the year. This was actually set to go to Spain at the time, but we had a family emergency, so I didn't get to go, so Spain is next year. But now I get to go and travel and ride my bike uh, all over the globe, as I hoped. And I can consume cannabis before or after, or the night before, or drink. I've got no trainer. I've got no one looking at me and bothering me. I get to do it in my greatest competition is myself. The only person I try to make proud is myself. And I just push myself, and it's a huge source of fulfillment in my life. There's the last one. And I'm sure a lot of people have heard it before. Not that many people are necessarily good at it. Give without expectation. And I really mean this. I don't mean say give and say, oh, no problem. And in the back of your head, you get a hidden agenda by, Hey, they might be hiring this fall. Hey, they might need me. Hey, they have a lot of money. They might feel bad for me. Whatever, right? Give with no expectation. It's actually incredible by the amount that you give, how much this comes back. And you can't even source where it came from. And the funny thing is, especially in sales, if any of you are interested in sales, you'll realize that when companies are tracking their sales, you can attribute sales to a lot of things. Referrals, social media strategies, advertising. But there's always going to be a pocket of sales. In every business that I've worked with, 30% of the sales, all the way up to 60% of the sales, come from a place that you can't even predict. Well, I was talking to someone on an airplane, and then they were at the resort, too. So we talked to them. I got back. I called my cousin. I knew them. They happened to be in there. And all of a sudden, it's just like, how you can't orchestrate that. A lot of things in life you cannot orchestrate. You can try your best, but you cannot. So if you just give and push positive out there and do things for people, and I don't mean let people take advantage of you and you just give, 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 and get nothing. I just mean is genuinely give, genuinely help. And it doesn't mean that you have to have all the answers. Sometimes people call me, and that may not be me at all, but I say, listen, I don't know anything about websites. This guy does. Call him. Tell him I sent you. I saw like, hey, by the way, you owe me. Let me know how it goes. No, it's good luck. And next thing you know, in a few months, they say, oh, yeah, I linked, linked, linked up with them. And then all of a sudden, I was uh, you know, at the Point Pleasant Park, and I talked to someone, and they knew you, and then they needed you. And like, things just, you, you can't predict this stuff. So it's so important to give without expectation. And the funny thing was, when I talk about going back and you know, asking questions, not being afraid to ask, following through with things, it was actually so incredible that, for example, when I was 20 years old, I was calling about mortgage brokers. And a mortgage broker said to me, hey, Kevin, here's all the information. You know, this is what you should be able, you know, planning to do. Um, and you know what? You have any more questions, you know how to reach me. Call me back. And I was like, OK, thank you. And he knew very well that I was five years away from buying a house. Since that time, I've referred that person three times, and I use them for myself. Because they show me two things. One, that they're an expert, because they gave the information. They weren't holding it. They didn't charge me for it. They gave the information because they knew what they were talking about. And secondly, they're someone that I wanted to work with because they seem reasonable. 
They seem informative. They seem kind. So automatically, I just want to reciprocate because their kindness just makes me want to give back to them. And I think a lot of people have that inclination to themselves as well. So I'm going to kind of wrap up, and I'm going to shift gears into cannabis a little bit. So ultimately, like I said, be yourself. It's easier. Be present in the down and the up. Find measures for yourself that aren't totally related to money. Lifelong learning is inevitable. Know yourself. What's the best way to learn? Like I said, put skin in the game if you can. Your surroundings will shape you. Be careful. Be resourceful. Don't be afraid to ask. Give with no hidden agenda. And I'm going to finish with this last piece, too, is I may have told you a lot of this stuff, like I said today. This is all stuff you've heard before. This is not brand new. But I'm not perfect either. Sometimes my wife tells me something, my parents tell me something, and I say, yeah, yeah. But then I speak to somebody here, and wow, you just spoke the truth to me, you know? All of a sudden, I'm listening. So what I inform you is when people tell you stuff, listen. Your professors, your parents, your peers, your colleagues, get fast passes. Jump the line. Skip a step. Because sometimes it's, it's funny how I've gotten great advice from people that have allowed me to get to the next step before the person behind me has got there. And the next thing you know, I'm, I'm already flying up the steps. I see it all the time with different people. So I know we've all been there. We've assembled something without reading the directions. You get halfway through and you're like, darn, I forgot this step. Wouldn't it have been nice to the person there that has built one before and said, hey, before you do this, make sure you stick this piece in there. Oh, good point instead of being hauled all the way back. And this is so important in many different businesses because when you go to start a business, like I said, I urge you to try things because you'll find things that you never even considered when someone in the industry say, oh, that's, that's normal. You're like, oh, well, I've never heard of that in a textbook or I've never seen that in my life. Well, this industry is different. And then the next thing you know, you work in another business, you say, hey, this happened over here. Could this happen here as well? And it stimulates those thoughts and it keeps you kind of aware and armed. And the last thing I want to mention is throughout this entire process, I reached my level of, of success, not, you know, I don't have, <laughs> I'm, I'm not where I want to be for a lot of things, but ultimately I have the pleasure of knowing that I wake up every morning and I look in the mirror and I say, what would I do today? And I do exactly what I would be doing today. If our business stopped tomorrow, if the building was bulldozed tomorrow, I would still wake up first thing, call my brother Andrew, and we would still be hammering away at this. This is, you may see it as my job, you may see it as my career. I see it as this is what I do. I get an email on Sunday morning, I answer it. I get a phone call on a Saturday, I deal with it. This is what we do, this is what we're working towards. And it's amazing if you can work on things that you're passionate about, you start removing the job feeling, the career feeling, and you say, hey, this is what I'm doing, and you just do it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about cannabis for a little bit, just to wrap up. So I had a number of things down here, uh, but then when I spoke to Peter Mombercat yesterday, <clears throat> he kind of brought up more questions that I said, oh, shoot, okay. Um, there's more information here that people are asking that maybe I'm just getting too ahead of myself. And also when you're submerged in something, you kind of sometimes assume that people know more than they do just because it's so, I don't want to say basic, but it's just so normal for your, through your day to day. So we'll talk a little bit about cannabis as a product. It's all in the strains. We have sativas, which are a euphoric, uplifting, energetic strain. And these are often great for social activities, exercise, other physical activity. We have indicas, which are physically, you know, a physical feeling, uh, sedative, relaxing. And this is good for watching, uh, observing, trying to relax or unwind. It, it's great for those sort of things. On top of that, we have a lot of, you know, information about THC and CBD. These are two cannabinoids. And I'll tell you something really cool, is that these are two out of nine. There's seven left. No one has ever touched them because Cannabis has been illegal for so long, there's been no research dollars, no research efforts towards it, so no one has really mined these additional cannabinoids just because there's been no funding and no support for it. There's another cannabinoid called CBG, which is actually really good for appetite suppressant. That'll be probably the next one to roll out, and that one's very interesting. Again, I find this very, you know, very interesting. So THC is what we kind of think about when people think about you know, being stoned, if you will. It's high feeling, hunger, intoxicating, kind of a euphoric feeling. The CBD is calming, uh, really non-intoxicating, and anti-inflammatory anti or alleviative. So this is more, you know, of course, towards medical. 
Um, and that's more towards maybe recreational, but the combination, you'd be surprised by the mixtures that, that certain things happen. So I'll tell you, as I lead into these and give these ex explanations, the things that I'm really excited for is now that we have this information, we can create experiences. So for example, maybe a number of years ago, if you were in the black market and you bought cannabis, you'd be buying dope, marijuana, cannabis, pot, weed, whatever you wanted to call it, and you'd have one drug dealer or provider that would say, hey, enjoy, tell you nothing. You'd go home, you'd have no idea what your experience would be. And if you wanted again, you go back to get it, they would have something different that you'd have no idea how to get that experience yet again. <clears throat> On the flip side, you got some drug dealers, of course, that would say, hey, here's, this is a sativa, you know, and this is the name of the strain, and you know, let's get this much THC, I think, Never been lab tested, but I'm going to take a guess, right? And you'd have it, and it'd be a wicked experience to say, and you say, hey, I want some more of that, and you get it next time, and it's totally different. The great thing for consumers, the tough thing for us, is our variance in the CBD and THC percentages is 0.04%. So if we're off by 0.04%, I've got to throw it in kitty litter and destroy it. That's literally the SLP. So essentially, it's very important that we create consistency for you know, our testing, but also for consumers. You have experiences that you can go back and retrieve. So my most exciting piece for all this is now that we have this information, we have consistency, and we can tailor experiences. You can try different THC, CBD combinations. You may think that one's maybe too intense, but one is really nice, or one's too light. You have levers that you can pull on, and then you can go back and get the consistent thing yet again. Right now at the NSLC, there's currently oil only dried flour. Uh, which Robinson's Cannabis is a provider of and not in shelves yet till uh, the new year. And they have oils available as well. So the really exciting thing for me is actually this next line, which is edibles, drinkables, vape pens, other consumables. The exciting thing about this is we think about, you know, I know we hear a lot in the news about people eating brownies and calling the police and all kinds of crazy things happening. Well, because before it was, here's an edible. We're putting cannabis into it. This input was never questioned. Was it sativa? Was it THC? Was it CBD? That was never questioned. It was just pot was going into food, you ate it, that was what you got, right? So the beautiful thing is, is now that we have these levers, you can eat different things and know what you're going to expect. Because I know, for example, myself, I don't really like edibles that much right now because one time I eat one, I want to run a marathon. The second time, I am one with the sofa. So ultimately, having these levers allows you to say, okay, I'm going to have a drink of something and it's going to make me very upbeat. I'm going to eat something, and I know full well it's going to make me go to sleep. And now we have this predictability. And the big thing I find, especially for new consumers, or consumers who are never try cannabis or coming to it after a long time, is there's comfort. You have comfort in knowing what kind of experience that you can expect. And it's, um, I think that's, that's huge, and uh, it's, it's extremely positive for the industry and getting people to adopt it and use cannabis in, in that fashion. The other thing, too, is not everybody likes to smoke cannabis or vape it, so it gives an introductory way for people to try cannabis in a way that's maybe um, less, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, but just scary, ultimately. So now we have this consumer knowledge, which is really good. Now we have different products, different experiences. This is what really excites me as a consumer and in the business about cannabis. So the industry, I'll just give you some information about it. In the industry, there's limited to no advertising. As you may have noticed, I didn't put one Robinson's Cannabis logo on their presentation today because I don't want to be fined a quarter of a million dollars. Legal and black markets, also a very interesting phenomenon because ultimately we have legal markets which have uh, you know, wealthy people ultimately or people in the markets you know, or in these capitalized markets or big businesses, corporations. And then, but all the, growing all the growing methodology is stuck in the black market by people that don't want to enter the, the market. And you know, I don't, shouldn't say I don't totally disagree with them, but they've been doing something for a long time, and all of a sudden it's legal, but they're not allowed to the tech party, or they don't understand the new rules. So it's, it can be frustrating for those people, but now we have a diversion. And that's why a lot of people say you know, the products in the stores may not be as good as what they're currently getting in the black market, because a lot of the skill sets are tied still in the black market. So it's kind of an interesting phenomenon that only will happen, I guess, with this, and it may have happened too in alcohol when prohibition occurred. So no advertising, product will do all the talking. I'm not sure if anyone's been to the NSLC yet to purchase cannabis. The bottles, you don't see anything until you make the purchase. And there's the advertisement, the brand is, I think it's a, 
I have the dimensions, but it's tiny, and we all have to follow it. So there's zero way to really make yourself look any different until they crack open that bottle. So right now, too, there's a divide between the medical and recreational. There's a lot of talk about you know, making sure that the recreational market um, and the medical market are somewhat separate because I believe that the medical market, um, of course, should deserve some sort of, of course, lower cost, maybe even free access, these sort of things, because people use it for medical purposes, and I've seen it. I've witnessed it, and I've become a believer. But the industry right now is brand new. So there's a lot of levers and a lot of things happening that are creating things that maybe we do not want. For example, there's a cost recovery fee. As participating in this market, we have to pay the government a cost recovery for making the regime. Well, only recreational players have to, have to pay it. Medical players do not. But if I'm in a market where I sell recreational and medical, I all of a sudden have to pay the fee on everything. They won't let me do both. So you either have to be a medical or you need to be recreational. All the money's in recreational right now. So no one wants to tag on a medical component to their business because all of a sudden they're paying fees on it. It's not a good business decision, unfortunately. And again, I, I sympathize for the medical patients, and I understand, but the system has created this. So again, things are new. And I think ultimately when I talk about the industry, when I tell a lot of people, when they give a lot of negativity towards it is, this is brand new. I went legal a week ago. <laughs> you know, So things are going to change. I'm quite confident when alcohol is prohibited, they never expected to end up on billboards, but it's on Barrington Street. It's on radio ads. You know, so it, it'll just take time, and, that, and that's okay. Again, guessing game. There we go. So how do you get into the industry? Well, this is, I don't want to say very simple because it's not, but ultimately it's all about the rules. If you want to play in the NHL but you don't know what offside is, it's going to be really hard. Okay? So ultimately, read the rules. Understand them. Understand the caveats, the conditions, what you can do with different things. It's really important for us because a lot of the times we get approached by a lot of different consultants, a lot of people trying to start their own business, people approaching us, and the first thing I do just to test them is I ask in reference to rules, how they meet the rules, how they plan to, how they report to Health Canada. And if they can't answer that, uh, you know, I, I can't give them a chance because what it tells me right away is A, they're ignorant, two, they're being lazy, three, they obviously have no passion if they really want to dig in here, and four, I can't trust them because they don't know the rules and I don't want to get into any conflict with them, so that, that makes it very hard. So if you want to get into the industry, understand the rules. The Cannabis Act is currently the platform as of October 17th. Before that, we had the Medical Marijuana Purposes and Regulations. After that, we had the Access to Cannabis for Medical Purposes Regulations. Now we have the Cannabis Act. All of them have caveats. All of them are like 300 pages with size 9 font. It's hard to read, trust me. But it has to be done. So ultimately, if you want to work in the space or start your own business, read the rules. If you want to work for a company in the cannabis space, read the rules. You'll be a gigantic asset. Because you know the rules and what the business has to face on a day-to-day -day in their operations, it'll actually be huge. You can really separate yourself. We have all of our employees from the top to the bottom read the rules because we don't want to be caught in any position where someone doesn't know them when we get into trouble. Secondly, as I urge a lot of people, is if you're really passionate about it, then fantastic. If you like to consume cannabis, does that mean you're passionate about it? Not necessarily. You don't have to, and that's okay. But ultimately, is I want to just mention something about this, is in your work that you do, a cannabis aside, is try to find things that you actually feel passionate about. And I understand at times you need to do things to get experience and try different stuff. It may not be your dream job to work in a box factory. But it's a good start, but as you move on and develop your work, think about businesses and industries that you actually find attractive and you think are really interesting. Because companies will actually be blown away if you show up to them and say, listen, I love X. I love your product line. I would love to be here. They will hire you in an instant if you have interest in their business because their whole time they're trying to get their people to be passionate. So if you show up with that genuine, pure interest, it'll actually get you quite far. And ultimately, the thing is with passion is people with passion have a special force with them. I can be just as smart as somebody that doesn't have passion, or they can be way smarter than me, but the fact that I'm passionate, I'll outgrit them, I'll outstamina them, and ultimately I'll have more resonance with my customers. So I'm just bound to have that extra edge on them just because I'm willing to give it that much harder because I truly care. So I'm going to kind of close with this on removing the stigma. Cannabis actually, unfortunately, got a bad rap in the 30s um, based on uh, racial and social status. 
Um, you know, people in the United States government essentially said that African Americans and Mexicans consume cannabis, so obviously made them stupid, made you poor, and all these false claims that, unfortunately, I don't want to say brainwashed the next generations, but it really did change the way that people thought, you know, coming uh, up to the 50s, 70s, 80s, even into the 90s. And I just want to say that I've come to realize through my work, um, travel all across Canada for the cannabis industry, it's amazing the incredible people that consume cannabis. Just because you consume cannabis doesn't mean that you're lazy. Doesn't mean that you're a stoner. Doesn't mean that you're a loser. Doesn't mean that you're incompetent. Because a lot of incredible people, a lot of efficient, productive people consume cannabis. To be honest, throughout my studies here, I consume cannabis the entire time. And I don't say I was, you know, stoned going to class. I never consumed cannabis, went to class, just to, you know, set the record straight. But I use it to relax. I use it to unwind. I use a good sativa for second gear if I need more energy when I've had a long day. I've used it for a lot of good purposes for my life. And I actually kind of feel somewhat shameful because I let the stigma drag on. Instead, I've kind of spoken to my professors and told them that, hey, I used cannabis last night after I studied, or I used it, you know, and we just didn't have that dialogue then. And I kept the stigma alive by hiding it and saying, you know, I'm a productive person, try to be successful, no cannabis here. But I did, right? So what I really urge everybody to think about today is, you know, to remove the stigma, talk about it. It's okay. Secondly, educate people. If they think there is information that's not true, feel free to show them you know, information. Third is defend cannabis, but also be realistic. Cannabis isn't perfect. Nothing is perfect. Things are good in moderation. Things are at good times. So ultimately, is it sucks to try to argue something where you're not, no, it's perfect. It's, you'll never get anywhere as trying to defend something by not admitting that it has its shortfalls. So ultimately, is defend it, but don't be blind to the fact that it's not perfect. And ultimately, I think the biggest part of, part of all of this is just, you know, cannabis, I think, is the future. It has a lot of different uses. Um, and I, I hope that you find ways that maybe you can incorporate your life or incorporate other people's life, because ultimately, it's not for everybody, and that's totally OK. Okay, so that pretty much wraps it up for me today. I want to thank all of you for being here. I hope you enjoy the conference. I know when I was here at the university, um, the conference was always a, a big part uh, of this time of year. A lot of good people here today that you're going to meet, a lot of other good speakers. Um, and uh, I wish you all the best. Um, and uh, don't be afraid to ask. Enjoy your day.